Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 48, Fly Casual, featuring a bunch of casual game suggestions from the Bellhop. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Uh, for those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on that After Show audio as well as the audio from our front desk, the pre-show banter, by backing our Patreon. As a thanks for supporting us, you also get other cool stuff like access to a private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show, pre-production show notes, behind-the-scenes blog posts, and sometimes more. Uh, tonight, we're answering a question looking for casual games to play with groups of four to six players. Now, after that main topic, I've got some Extra Life 2019 announcements to make, and I'm going to be talking about gaming at a brand new venue uh, during our Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment. As part of that, you'll get to hear some of my thoughts on games like Go Cuckoo, Gentis, The 8-Bit Box, Blockus, and Sync Tear. I'm also going to spend a bit of time waxing nostalgic about one of my favorite games from my childhood, Cats. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of for the past week. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, up first, we've got yet another comment on our ridiculously popular Gloomhaven FAQ video on YouTube, uh, the video that just keeps giving. Uh, this one, though, is not quite as positive as some of the previous ones. Bill Jensen writes, I'm fine with opinion, but I was hoping for more information and less banter. Having said that, this is still a great video, and it's great you made it. Keep up the great content. Well, thanks for the feedback, Bill. Banter is kind of what we do. It comes from knowing each other for the better part of our lives. <laughs> but note taken, we can perhaps structure it better if we do further FAQs. That one was completely impromptu. Yeah, not even planned. We didn't even know we were doing it that yeah. night. Now, TNN left a comment on the Bellhop's Shadowrun Beginner Box review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. TNN writes, personally, I felt the Alphaware Runner's Toolkit is a far better introductory set to this. While it still suffers from lack of order, it's far more comprehensive, plus much nicer box. Well, thanks for commenting, TNN. Uh, that's good to know, but at this point, it's a little late. Because uh, this year, Catalyst Game Labs actually released the new 6th edition of Shadowrun, which I swear is awfully close to when 5th came out. It feels to me like 5th is still pretty new. But I'm not quite sure exactly how big a gap it was it's, it's actually so, quite a few years is it it's like, okay it's no, like it's four years me. but they they kept re-releasing like the beginner box stuff ah. okay so when i picked up the beginner box it was already a little old yeah so at this point instead of trying to figure out fifth edition and diving into the alphaware box which i did see because that was actually something in the beginner box that recommends you buy next it was like buy this alphaware box or buy the core rule book and i'm like eh, i didn't have a great impression from the starter set so what i decided to do is that maybe i'll finally dive in and play shadow run with the sixth edition maybe that'll be my gateway instead of fifth because i tried to go to fifth and kind of hit a, a a roadblock with that starter set so to this end while i was at origins last week two weeks whenever origins it was a while ago now with the con crud probably about three weeks now sorry whenever i was at origins I met with Catalyst Game Labs, and I convinced them to give me a review copy of the new 6th edition starter set, uh, which is called the 6th World Beginner Box. Now, at this point, I've recorded an unboxing video of that, and I think someone may have read my review, because when I went through that box just quickly, it looks like a much better set than the last one. And to your last comment, it comes in a much nicer box. 
Now, I'm not sure when I'll get to the actual review, but if you tune in here, I'm sure we'll let you know when it does. Uh, as for the unboxing, you'll expect to see that some Monday night on YouTube, probably fairly soon. Now, up next, I've got a comment from Chamberlain2 on our geeking out about the geek episode, which we um, drug out of the archives and launched while I was away at Origins. The only thing I really use BGG for anymore is rule questions slash clarifications. Used to be on there several times a day looking at things. Get most of my news, reviews, etc. from podcasts and YouTube nowadays. Well, thanks for commenting, Chamberlain2. Honestly, I can't really blame you. For me, BGG is a reference, a sort of a Wikipedia for games. It's not a go-to source for news or reviews for us either, as it's yeah. easier to go to YouTube and pick a review from sources you've already vetted rather than pitching from the random or potentially random options that BGG happens to have for that game. So not a ton of feedback this week, but I do thank everyone who comments, emails, replies, and engages with our content. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Uh, so today we've got a lot of chat about uh, food because of uh, some of our pre-show discussions about uh, QCC. Uh, but also, uh, Jeff is loved Shadowrun when he had time to prep it. Uh, he yeah. GM'd 3rd, 4th, and 5th edition um, as the main thing for most of his gaming lifetime. That's interesting to know because I know Jeff as, to me, Jeff's the indie gamer of Windsor. He's he's the guy that gets into the, the weird story games and has has a, a John Wick love affair for for games from him. Uh, it's, it's interesting to know he came from such a traditional game. But yeah, Shadowrun's definitely, as far as I can tell, still a very traditional game in the fact that it expects the Dungeon Master, Game Master, whatever they go by, I'm sure not Dungeon Master, to do a lot of prep beforehand. Plus, it is, at its core, a, a heist game, right? So that definitely requires more prep than, hey, um, we're on an airship and someone's captured Lady Blackboard, go. So it's interesting to see that he's switched over. Um, I'm just wondering from Jeff, maybe you can answer this as the show goes on, if he's checked out any of the sixth edition that's been out yet. Now, besides that, uh, we are going to be looking for casual game suggestions. So chat room, I've got a ton of them that I'm going to go through more than I probably should have put in one episode. But I'm counting on you guys to let me know, guys and girls, my bad, uh, to let me know which ones I missed. Because I am not a huge casual gamer. I do play some. I host events that require casual games. I'm more on the heavier side. So I want to know about those good light games, those good casual games I may miss throughout the show. And Jeff points out that Shadowrun broke him, which is why he plays all of the indie that, games. That's, that's what I kind of thought. I didn't want to draw that conclusion myself. Mike, I never he, he refused to play any game that uses a D6 dice pool ever again. It's good. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll be chat back stopping by the lobby a few more times later in the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get questions to me is through the website. That way they don't get lost out there on the web. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we have a question from longtime Bellhop fan, Emmett O'Brien. Emmett asks... What are some good games for casual group four to six players? Everyone knows Catan, Ticket to Ride, etc. For a beer and pretzel kind of nice, I'm extra interested and I'm extra interested in cooperative games or building games because that's what my wife likes. Well, thanks so much for the question, Emmett. I actually met Emmett at QCC last year. I wonder if he'll be back this year. Now, I think a lot of people think mass market when they hear casual, but that's absolutely not required. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to be leaning towards the mass market games here, though there are some I probably could have put on the list. Now, personally, I love a heavy Euro. Um, sometimes I'm in the mood for a uh, thematic Ameritrash game, something that goes on for hours. But it's not often I'm in the mood for a real light game, something quick. Um, but... 
more often than me wanting to play something like it's the people I'm with that aren't really interested in spending more than 10 minutes learning a game. And most of the people I game with in public, at least, are not interested in playing a game that's going to last three, four hours. So often when games are suggested at a casual get together, the one thing I've noticed is that the people are usually there for the get together more than the game. It's not really about the games. It's about doing an activity together. It's a social thing. So because of this, the types of games you should be looking at when you're looking at a casual game night are shorter, easy to teach games and games that have a lot of player interaction. Whenever you're picking games to play, it's important to know your audience and pick games that fit that group. If you don't know your audience well, you're going to have to want to focus on games that have a universal appeal. Mm -hmm. Either way, we suggest having a both group specific and generic games on hand, as you never know exactly what will go over well and what might not. Yeah, and speaking of games not going over well, remember one of these things that we mention a lot on the podcast, on the show, I mentioned on the blog, is you don't have to finish a game you've started. Uh, don't fall for the lost time fallacy. More so than usual, casual game night is about having fun playing games. It's not about who's winning or losing or who's going to win the tournament at the end of the night. It's more about the joy of playing games with others. If you find that a game you're facilitating or one you're playing isn't going well, don't be afraid to stop it and start up something else. Now, sometimes it's hard to tell if people are having a bad time or just focused on the game. But you know what? It never hurts to stop, pause, and say, hey, is everyone having fun? And if we're not, we can move on to something else. Gaming is about experience. So make sure that fun competitive balance is hitting the right spot for both your intentions and your audience. Now, as usual, for one of these game recommendation posts, uh, we're going to break things down into a few different categories. I'm hoping this makes it easier to find games that best fit your casual game group. Now, Emmett is specifically looking for games for four to six players. So what I'm going to try to remember to do while we're doing this is mention the maximum player count for each game. Now, starting off, great games for pretty much any casual game night. These are games which have the most universal appeal. They're quick to teach and highly engaging. Most of these games, people will want to play multiple times in a row. Yeah, I bet you there's one game people can predict I'm going to mention in this segment at some point. That's, that's our chat room bonus question to see how, how if you've been paying attention. Now, number one for me in this category is going to be Sagrada. Uh, this is a brilliant dice drafting and placement game all about building stained glass windows. Uh, it's simple to teach, but deceptively deep once you start playing. When you're like, oh, wait, I can't place there because I already have this number in this row and so on. Uh, the thing is, it's slightly difficult the first time you play to get the scoring. So it almost takes two games to play, but it's quick enough that you can usually fit two games in. But again, what I suggest in this game is play two to three turns and then start over. Go, everyone got it. Everyone understand the dice placement rules. All right, now we're going to play for real. Put all the dice back in the bag and start playing. Sagrada also has the bonus of uh, looking good, table appeal. It's the dice are bright colored. There's a lot of tactileness in this game of touching things, which is also tends to get casual gamers more involved than, say, a hand of cards or a pile of tiles. All right, and next up? Uh, we have King of Tokyo. Now, pretty much everyone has played Yahtzee growing up, so this one is often an easy sell. You get your group together and go, hey, we're going to play giant monster King of the Hill using not Yahtzee-like dice. Now, for a real casual group, stick to the basic game, where you're not going to use any of the power-ups or anything. You can even skip the cards and just play the dice version. Throw the cards in if you got gamers in the group or people who played a few card games and then even better if you do want a better experience overall you can try adding the power up expansion because what that does is it makes it matter what monster you are so every monster has a unique thing they end up being asymmetric that way and then another thing since you're all just playing to have fun is give everyone a power card to start so they start off asymmetric what i dig about this game is because it does scale like that like, this is light enough, you can play it with young kids, to throw all the stuff in, and it's heavy enough that it's going to keep gamers heavy, happy, but it's still a light game. Like, it's, when I'm saying keeping gamers happy, you're not really ostracizing anyone else. Now, it's a great game that you can chat during. There's no real yeah. heavy thought or paying attention to other people. 
Uh, my experience was that it was a little less enjoyable with at the highest player counts. Uh, and I believe BG, BG backs me up there and says around four is sort of the the sweet spot. Um, but uh, the full table of like I think it was six was was not great because there was some, you just sort of by the time it got around to you there really wasn't anything you could do anyway. Yeah. Well, the, the last time you played, I think, was on New Year's, too, and we stretched it. We were playing for, with one more player than the game's even supposed to handle because I had grabbed one of the expansion characters I happened to have from uh, the Panda, which is from the Power Up expansion, and went, well, let's try it with one more player. Right. So we did We did kind of stretch it further than it should have went. Even with 6, though, yeah, Board Game Geek, I think, says 4 is the best. And I am. I told you I would forget to do it. So Sagrada plays four or five, four players with the base game, five players with the expansion. Uh, the expansion you can just add just to add another player, or there's some modules you can add. King of Tokyo is supposed to play with six. We played it with seven or eight, but it's supposed to play six, best with four. Up next is a game that's been on many of my lists uh, because I love it so much, and that's Pitch Car. This is the game I break out when I have no clue what to expect at a game night. When I'm in public, I expect casual gamers, non-gamers, possible bar attendees, um, and who knows, maybe a heavy war gamer even showing up. Uh, what I like about this game is this is great for getting total non-gamers to play because people don't see it as a game. They see it as an activity, and I've seen people even liken it to a sport. Uh, I've met very few people who don't enjoy flicking their little wooden disc race car around the black tracks of pitch car. Now the base set is good enough for a fun night. Uh, you just get some basic curves and straights and you can make it probably about 40, 50 different setups just with that. But man, toss in even just one expansion to add some really unique track layouts. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and while I was thinking of this, uh, the other one that reminded that, uh, popped into mind that wasn't on this list is the penguin game. Ice cool, uh, yeah. Ice cool. It's four player only. So I tried to limit the four player games. I tried to go with five and six. Right. I did mention one four player game, which we're going to get to next, which is the game I figured everyone would have guessed I'd be talking about here, and that's Azul. I've mentioned this game many times on the podcast, and the thing I tend to say about it is that this game has pretty much universal appeal. Uh, it is perfect for so many different types of game groups because it's a game where you can take it as seriously as you want. You can just draft tiles and play some and eh, some stuff breaks, no big deal. Or you can sit and agonize over which particular tiles to take because you're trying to predict the person two turns from now really needs that blue and you need to get it before them. And both ways are very valid ways to play. Um, this is the game that I have found my friends keep buying to get their families to play. Uh, this was the first game Tori and Kat bought to bring to the cottage, right? Uh, this is a game where people are like, oh, I brought this home and I taught my mom. I play with my grandma, right? This is, I, we got our next door neighbors over to play. Uh, not only is this game great, it's visually enticing, and it tends to catch the interest of even the most jaded non-gamers because they're like, oh, what are you doing? Yeah, now note, this is Azul and not Azul Stained Glass of Sintra. Yes. While fun, I just don't think Sintra is as suitable for casual play because it's more thinky. Uh, the scoring no. and the intricacies of scoring means you're spending a lot more time focused on your board than you are being able to, you know, chatter or drink some coffee. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Sintra is not on this list purposely. Now, the problem with this for Emmett's requirements is this only plays four. So if you have four players, you're good. But at this point, there is no five or six player expansion from Azul, which is slightly surprising to me. It seems like something easy enough. Just put some more tiles in the bag and it would work. Now, up next to the game I've been talking a lot about since Origins. That's Go Cuckoo from Haba Games, which plays five players, but I honestly don't see a reason you couldn't play six. This is my newest go-to Break the Ice game. Uh, it's a kid's dexterity game. Uh, since I've gotten it, I have played it with gamers, non-gamers, uh, parents of kids, and kids. Everyone I have shown this to game to falls in love with it. Um... We've been playing this like crazy. Like, it's actually at the point, I think it's already my most played game of 2019. Uh, I've got it in my van now. It's in the trunk. Just in case we end up somewhere and I have some spare time, I can break it out. It's a perfect icebreaker, perfect casual game. I, I don't see why you couldn't play up to six players with this, just giving people less eggs. Because it's all about playing your eggs. All right. Well, next up, party games were made for casual game nights. We all know the Bellhop isn't a big party gamer, but here's a few of the party games he's actually had some fun with. <laughs> it does happen. 
Uh, number one is telestrations for laughs. If you, this is a good, you want casual uh, going to Emmett's beer and pretzels. If you got the beer flowing, this is a great one. Uh, there are three different versions of the game out. You can buy the six player version, the eight player, the 12 version, player version. So those are obviously the max player accounts. Personally, I don't see reason to buy anything but the 12 player version, but it is a little harder to find. Now, this is a modern version of the telephone game or a game called Eat Poop You Cat, which, yes, that's actually the name of a game. I don't know. I think it's like one of those hand-me-down games that people taught other generations. But anyway, um, player gets a word. You draw it. Then you pass the book to your next player. They look at what you drew and guess what it was. Then you pass the book to the next player. They look at what that person wrote and they draw that. And it keeps going around. And almost never does it get back to that first player. And that last picture or last word matches the word on the cover of the book. That's the whole point of it. Uh, my only tip for this game, though, is that's it. Do that. Ignore the scoring system. Just Toss it out, play once around the table, play five rounds, play until midnight, set a time limit. Uh, don't base it on the actual rules of the game, which is like a three. It's like a three series pass where you vote on who you think drew the best and throw all that out. Just play it as a, as a, uh, what's the word? Events, not the word I want, but pl activity. Play it as an activity. Now, the hilarity, especially among friends who think they all know the same in-jokes, <laughs> but can't draw those in-jokes is fantastic and uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That's a cute one. So that was Telestrations. Uh, again, I recommended the 12 player version of that game. For not only does it play 12, it has sharper sharpies in it or sharper dry erase markers, which does help. The other nice thing about Telestrations too is you don't really have to be able to draw, you have to get an idea across. So it's not about artistic ability. Because sometimes I hate those games where they're required, some kind of player skill is required, especially guessing games on a team, which leads us to concept. Now, according to the box, concept plays 12 players, but really you can have as many people playing as can see the board. I, I don't even know how many people we played concept with, but definitely more than 12. Now, this is another one. Throw out the scoring rules. Just treat it as an activity. Uh, one of the players is going to get a clue. And or it's, it's a concept, right? A name or something. And then they have this board full of icons and then they have little plastic pieces. And what they do is they put the plastic pieces on the boards of icons to try to get the other players to guess what their concept is. Now, I know that sounds weird, but if you could see it, it makes perfect sense. You just see all these icons. It's, it's really solid. This is my favorite team based or group party game. Um, I advocate for concept as often as I can. The other thing that's cool is because the player count is basically limited to who can see the board, the company that made this game realized that and now puts out a large size neoprene mat just to make it more obvious so that things are more visible. Yeah, this one has come up many times in the show. Uh, it's rare we do a recommendation show without it, it seems. Yeah, it does seem that way. There was, there's actually a lot of overlap on this particular episode to some of the stuff we've done before. Up next is a game I probably wouldn't have recommended a year ago, and that is Codenames. Now, Codenames is another one that says a listed player count of eight, but I've definitely played with many more. Uh, again, it's about being able to see the cards that are out on the table. As long as people can see it, you can get more people. Um, I was not a fan of this when I first played it, but last year during our Gaming in the New Year party, someone suggested we broke it out. and Man, I had a great time. So I don't know what happened those first few plays, but as of now, I'm a Codenames convert. Now, what I like about this game series is that if you have a group, especially for like you're trying to find casual games, and we kind of get to the suggestion later, but like if you have fans who are really into the Marvel Cinematic Universe or into comics, there's a Marvel Codenames. If you're playing with uh, fans of Disney, there's a Disney Codenames. If you have a group that has difficulty reading, whether that's um, vision issues or younger audience, there's a code name pictures and you can mix and match all these two, which I think is very cool. Yeah. So ignore the player count. Just, I mean it, as long as you have an even number or you're happy with the teams, even if it's not an even number yeah. and you, and everyone can shift around to see the cards, you're good. And you will end up yelling. So mm -hmm. <laughs> just be aware. And make, make sure here, here's an important concept tip. Make sure you have all agreed to a system for when a clue has been finalized. 
One we like to use is one player touches the card, and that player, and only if that player touches the card, does it count. Because you'll have problems with people yelling out answers and going with it, and the hard part is, as the, the moderator, you're not supposed to react. And it's so hard not to if everyone's yelling at you and someone's like, wait, it's this! And you're like, no, Sean hasn't touched the card yet. Is that your final answer, right? Come up with some system, whatever that happens to be. For us, it tends to be the person sitting closest to the clue givers, sits and touches the, the appropriate card. Now, my last party game suggestion is a game called But Wait, There's More. Uh, this one says 10 players. That seems high to me. I think it would take way too long to get back around to your turn. But I think four to six players is perfect. Now, this is one of those pitching games, like not baseball pitching, like you're pitching a sales pitch. Uh, there are a bunch of these out there. Uh, you're going to make a product pitch on the spot of all the ones I've seen. There's like snake oil and there's a couple, excuse me, a couple others, but wait, there's more is the best of the bunch I've tried. Now the problem with, but wait, there more is it requires a lot of creative energy and creative thought. So don't let the game too long because it can burn people out and make sure people have bought in before you start. Cause you are basically doing the Ron Co pitch for something you're going to get random cards you're going to start pitching a thing and then part way through your pitch you're going to flip a card and say but wait there's more and add another feature that's the whole thing with the game and now other players can even mess with you and then play a but tell me more card and you have to keep going so it's one of those games that i find i can play in small bursts and i have a lot of fun with it but i can't play multiple times in a row just because i'm burnt out so I haven't gotten to try this one, but I think that I'd actually love to. Uh, maybe something early in the New Year's mm -hmm. uh, before the crowd gets too big. Uh, and uh, B BGG says that it's a five-player ideal. So yeah, I could see that. It, you know, I said ten. Just, up to like, ten, yeah. take too long, right? Like you have ten people pitching you things, and then you got to vote on who you think pitched it the best, right? That just, I, I don't know, that seems too long. So in the chat room, we've had a uh, number of suggestions out there. Jeff is saying Monikers is a huge hit. Every time he brings it out, that's what uh, I haven't played. That's I, that's a definitely a party game. Yeah, and I mean it's a seven, it's tried. it's almost an eight on BGG. So wow, yeah. Uh, timeline challenge is a great casual game for four to six. It's timeline with an actual game attached. Well, that's interesting. So I played timeline and I wasn't impressed. It was just a little too simple. It was just too basic. Plus, it's one of those eventually you learn the timeline and you can master it, which I guess it makes sense because it's partly an educational game. It'd be interesting to see, Jeff, uh, what the difference is between Timeline Challenge and normal. Well, Timeline Challenge has got a 7.1 on there, so. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, like Timeline, I'd give like a 5, so it's interesting. Um, uh, Major Kayla is saying uh, Betrayal. One I'm, of assuming the that's be I'm assuming that's Betrayal a House on the Hill. Personally, I think that's more of a gamer's game. Plus, I've seen that game fail where you get the, the noob shows up and you hand them the Betrayer book and they're like, go in another room and read this. And they come back and they're like, I know nothing about game mechanics. What's this mean? So I, that's not one I would recommend. Uh, one of the Fluxes, which is, I think, yep. a pretty easy to go-to. Not go -to. me, but yeah, that's a go-to. <laughs> uh, Dice Forge. I've heard good things on that. Uh, Groves. Don't know that. Uh, Sword and Skull. Or that. Uh, c Gobblestones. Okay, a whole bunch of games. You can tell <laughs> I don't like light games. Machi, I'm like, Machi Koro. All right, that one I know. Machi Koro, I, I've heard good things. Uh, the, there's a broken strategy. So as long as you're playing with casual gamers who don't know the broken strategy, perfect. If, if they know the broken strategy, or if you just have one person that knows the broken strategy. Now, I hear the Harper expansion fixes that, but I already gave up on Machi Koro by then. <laughs> uh, and Sword and Skull is Avalon Hill. Oh, that's got to be a classic then. Wow. And, okay. uh, and then Mealborn. Which oh, is, I totally yeah, agree on that. that that's a classic card game. Um, There's a I, mass market game I wouldn't mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, those are go-to games, easy to teach, not much thinking. Uh, right. Sword and Skull is an awesome transition game for classic board gamers, apparently. Okay. Yeah, and, I, don't, I don't know Sword and Skull at all. Uh, and In Fighting, I-N-N, -N, Fighting. I've heard of it, but I haven't tried that Works one. well for a long wait at a restaurant, I guess. All right. Sounds good. Uh, and oh, and she almost forgot Rune. Uh, Ruin, sorry, Ruin. Ruin. That's one I don't know again, too. You can tell I don't like nor It's not often you get an episode where there's a bunch of games. I don't know. Uh, so in, infighting is actually a Wizards of the Coast uh, D&D &D yep. theme. Yeah, that one I'm aware of. Um, actually, there's one I might have been able to put on this list. I had forgotten about the uh, Red Dragon Inn. 
the one about drinking and gambling at a pub after you're spending the dragon's cash. That could have been on this list. And Ruin is uh, by Buffalo Games from 2008. Wow. Uh, a ruthless Buffalo race Games. to fortune and glory. Interesting. I'll have to look into that. So next, we're going to take a look at cooperative games. These are great for getting casual gamers to play together. Sometimes people are scared of learning something new. Uh, they're worried they'll make mistakes or seem stupid. A great way to combat this is to suggest that everyone play a game together. Cooperative games mean that players who know the game can help the players who don't. Just be sure to nip any quarterbacking in the bud. Now, the number one I've got to mention, everyone knows this has to be mentioned. If you talk cooperative games, it's got to happen. Uh, that's Pandemic. Now, for one reason, it's not great for Emmett's recommendation because it only plays four. So we're not going to get up to that five, six player count. But what I have seen people do with Pandemic that actually works well is you team up. Because really, if you're playing with mostly open information anyway, it doesn't really hurt. Just your group makes all decisions together. Now, the theme is very approachable. Mechanics tie well into the room, the rules. Like you get flying across the country to do different things and you get building uh, centers to cure diseases. Uh, this is one of the few games I have actually seen people high-fiving at the end when they win or just insisting we got to try again when they lose. Now, I'll admit it is not my favorite co-op game, but it deserves to be on this list because I cannot deny the public appeal of Pandemic. People love this game. Yeah, and one thing about Pandemic is the recognition. Uh, yeah. It's almost a mainstream game mm -hmm. now these days with so, and that can really help your acceptance at a table. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I said, normally, I, if you're going to ask me to play, I'll moderate. I'll teach you guys to play. Not, not a game for me, but it, it has to be mentioned. If I'm talking co-op games that are that are Casual, it's perfect. Uh, now, up next is a one of my favorite, all-time favorite co-op games. One of my favorite games to pull out to public play events, and that is Shadows Over Camelot, which plays a total of seven players. So it's not often you get a game that plays that many, especially cooperative. Now, technically, this is a hidden trader game, or you want to say a team game, where you have one versus many. But during a casual game night, what I do is I pull out the trader rules and I run the game as a pure cooperative game, which is why I threw it on this list. Now, if the players are able to win, then consider introducing that trader mechanic. One of the other things that's great about this game is that players can literally drop in and out as the game is in progress. You can have someone leave and they're like, oh, I've had enough or if they, another game starts or they can jump back in. Now, one thing I do find this game is great for is if you've got role players. If you got some role players at your board game at night, some D&D &D players, they're going to dig this game because they get to play a Knight of Camelot. And part of the game is actually talking in character because you're not allowed to discuss the actual numbers on your cards. So this is a great one for hooking role players. Right. Now, note this is the older board game that's hard to find, not the newer card game that's still in print. Yeah, do not get the card game. <laughs> skip the I, card not, game, folks. Just, just skip the card, especially for casual players. Yeah. The card game is definitely for more advanced players. And personally, I don't knock a lot of games, but I would just skip the card game overall. So that was Shadows Over Camelot. Up next, um, every time we talk about co-ops, I mention this game. This is my preferred pandemic. Uh, that is Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Now, this is Play 6. Um, this is the game I'm going to grab over Pandemic anytime because to me, there is something more engaging about putting out a fire and saving grandma from a burning building over removing cubes from a map of the world. The thing is, due to this level of engagement, always get people's consent before breaking this game out. This theme can be a touchy subject for people. If they have experienced a fire in their life, they're probably not going to want to relive that through a board game. Now, assuming you can get buy-in, this is one of the best cooperative games I've ever played. Now, it has a variety of rules. If you're playing with a casual group, just stick to the family rules. Don't worry about having your fire engines and your cars and different player abilities. Just stick to your st standard basic four actions of moving, axing a wall, putting out fires, and carrying people. Now, and that is great for all ages, too. I mean... Yep. So in the chat room, uh, Uncle Ook has mentioned Castle Panic uh, with Major Kayla and Meeps and Peeps popping up and saying Star Trek Panic uh, is their their <laughs> preference. 
the thing with those two, okay, Castle Panic, I, I, I considered putting it on the list. The fact I don't own it is why I didn't feel justified putting it on the list because I find it a little too late. Star Trek Panic, though, is the opposite. I don't think Star Trek Panic is a casual gamer's game. It, once you get Star Trek Panic out with the mission rules and there's different shield directions, uh, there's just way more going on, and it's way harder. So it's going to be less fun for a group. Like, to me, Castle Panic's more fun. Star Trek, I do think, is a better game. I personally own Star Trek Panic, whereas I don't own Castle Panic. But for casual gaming, I personally say stick to ca Castle Panic. Or there's a zombie version, which I think is just called Zombie Panic. So if people are into that zombie theme, it might be a good call. Star Trek Panic, though, save that for your Trekkie friends who want to dive into minutia and small elements and min-maxing their turns. Now... Don't be afraid of some lighter hobby board games on your casual game night. Just because you have a group of casual gamers waiting for you doesn't mean you have to leave all those heavier hobby games at home, especially if the group has at least some gaming experience. There are some great next step games that can go over really well on a more relaxed game night. And here are some of the current favorites. Uh, number one for me in this is uh, people are going to say bring Soro to a casual game night. I don't recommend that. It's over too quick and your decisions almost don't matter. Uh, it's, it's far too random which tiles you have. What I do recommend is a game called Cable Car or San Francisco Cable Car or Metro. They're all the same name for the same game. Metro and Cable Car are slightly different themes. Uh, this is the route building game for casual game night for me because... You toss the stock market rules out, but it's the fact you're trying to complete multiple routes, so you have multiple trains, and the fact you can play your tiles anywhere completely blows away Soro and turns this into a really good game. Uh, yeah, no, uh, it, and we've we've spoken about Cable Car in the past. It's uh, you know it's a solid game uh, whether you're going with Cable Car or its original uh, version of Metro. Yeah. And that one plays six. I don't know if I mentioned that. Uh, up next is a, to me, is a ridiculously hidden, hidden gem game that no one's heard of for some reason. Uh, this is a game called Sink Tear, or Five Cities in English, but it's sold under the name Sink Tear. You won't be able to find this Five Cities. Uh, with Five Cities, it also plays five players. Uh, this is a classic from Rio Grande games no one's heard of. Uh, we just played this last week. I'll be talking more about this game, actually, when we get to the Tabletop Gaming Weekly. Personally, I think this is a fantastic next step game, or even gateway game for the right group. It's all about collecting colored cards similar to games like Ticket to Ride, then using those cards to buy fruits, and then delivering those fruits to five different villages in order to fulfill public order cards. So think of your root cards and Ticket to Ride, but public. I really recommend this game. Sadly, though, it is out of print and Amazon prices are crazy. But if you can find a copy of this one, I think it's a solid gem for that step up that next game that it's not a monopoly it's a step up from ticket to ride or you got people who already have some gaming knowledge trying to break them into like a, an actual euro style game yeah just be aware uh because it is probably the highest weight game we have mm. on the list so uh just you know buyer beware make sure you are you are planning for the fact that it is that little bit more thinker when it comes to the casual games yeah, this is, this is definitely a step up from Ticket to Ride. So if you've got a group that had difficulty with Ticket to Ride or wants to have more fun, because Ticket to Ride's a lot of planning and thinking, you might want to avoid Sync Tear. Uh, up next is one, this is new, just to prove that we're not all just about old games here that are out of print and sell for $300, uh, is Legendary Forest from ELO. Uh, this is an oddly a re-theme of a Japanese game about 8-bit pixel graphics uh it plays five players in the game you're building forests using the same set of 25 tiles so everyone has the same 25 tiles of those 25 tiles 20 are going to come into play and the order is randomized so every player is going to play the same tiles in order and what i dig about this game is you have the same input and at the end everyone's forest is completely different 
The scoring system is a real weird in this game, but it's pretty simple where you're going to basically score areas of the same colored matching leaves, I guess you'd call them. Uh, what's odd is this game I thought came out this year. It's a little older than I thought originally, and I have heard nothing about this game until Ian brought it out at a demo night at the CG Realm, and I played it, and I'm like, wow, this is solid. This is a really solid game. Why is no one talking to me about this? Yeah, so that's a 2017 um, yeah, so and it's, it's described by many as sort of a quick multiplayer solitaire. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely no real player interaction. The only thing that you interact at all is you have to draft these trees, and that's how you score. And you pick a color of tree and you put it in one of your fields, and that's how it scores. And there is a chance one of them will run out before another. So there's your player interaction of I could get the tree before you get it, and that's it. Other than that, you're all doing your own thing. And that was Legendary Forest Plays 5. The last one it I have in this category is Tiny Towns. This is a game for up to six players. I would have to assume you need at least two. I didn't put the minimums here. Uh, this was another one that I knew absolutely nothing about until Ian broke it out at the CD Realm. Uh, I did see some buzz after the fact, interestingly enough. Uh, if anyone has played the app Triple Town. That is like I strongly recommend the app Triple Town. It's from Spry Fox Games. This to me is the board game version of Triple Town and is just as good as the app. Uh, each turn, one of the players is going to name a resource. Everyone else has to take that same resource and put it on a four by four grid. You're eventually going to put the cubes into patterns that match building cards that are out on the table. So once your cubes match the pattern, you then take the cubes off and replace them with a meeple that represents that building. What's really difficult in this game is that each of those hexes can only hold a building or a resource. So it's all about trying to fit your buildings in and getting the right sets to build your town. Uh, each building then scores and scoring is completely different depending on what buildings are in play. Now, this game is way deeper than it first looks, uh, but it's still easy enough to teach that it could be perfect for your casual game night. Yeah, and uh, Tiny Towns does have a solo mode, actually, so you can do one to six oh, players. There you go. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, its buzz has really sort of grown with mm -hmm. time. It's, it's just out this year, uh, and so I think it was a slow burn, but it is ranking up. It's al already well over uh, 1.7, uh, you know, yeah, 1,700 ratings wow. on uh, BGG. So. Yeah, I think I think what happened with this one is no one expected anything good out of it. Like, looking at the box, it looks interesting. It's a lot of wooden bits. It's another grid game. But then you play and you're like, oh, wow, there's some good decisions here. Even just deciding what cube to pick, because there you have that player interaction of, oh, wait, he's got an awful lot of wheat over there. And if I use wheat, I can build a cottage. And it screws him because he's got too many wheat. That's a good move, right? Like, there, there's a lot more thinking than you first think. I do recommend if you're playing casually, toss out the monument rules for the first couple games and start with the beginner buildings. I've now played with both, and the beginner buildings are definitely easier to score and understand. Right. So back in the chat room, uh, Jeff is saying that Pandemic the Dice game is way fun. Might even say more fun for casual play than standard Pandemic. That's Pandemic the Cure is the, the dice version of Pandemic, and I, I agree, actually. I didn't feel the need to own it, but I would always prefer to play the Cure over base Pandemic. There we go. Uh, Major Kale is saying, uh, Suro, we like when we're winding down or half asleep, half, half asleep in an event. Yeah, well, half asleep is about all you need to be. Half awake <laughs> is all you need in Suro, because like I said, there's just not enough actual decisions in that game. The thing Suro is good for is if you have multiple tables playing games and you need like five, six minutes to keep people busy while they wait for a game to play. And if they need 15 minutes, they play two rounds. That's the only thing I found it good for. I used to like bringing it out to public play events to leave it on a table set up and be like, oh, you're wrapping up. They're wrapping up in about five minutes. Why don't you go play some Suro? Okay. But it's not what I would break out if I just had five to six people I was gaming with all night. Now, Meeps and Peeps is uh, wondering if Hanabi is casual enough. I could see it. Uh, the main reason, I tried to keep the four-player games off this list because Emmett was looking for four to six players. And four-player, like I did leave Azul on here. Uh, Hanabi, I think, oh, maybe it plays five, actually. I'm thinking it was only four players, but then I'm picturing a game. Hanabi, uh, it's, I think it's casual enough. Uh, Hanabi, it's, Hanabi is two to, four, two to five, best at four. Oh, yeah, so it does play. I, I've only played four, so it does play five. Yeah, I could be on this list. It's not my favorite game. Um, 
it does take a bit to explain. So the neat thing with Hanabi is it's a card game or tile game where you can't see your own cards and you're trying to get other people to play cards in numeric order without with having very limited communication rules. We'll keep it at that without getting into the full games. So yeah, I dig, I, I could see Hanabi, not my personal recommendation. Uh, I find quarterbacking issues and I find bad feelings. People get upset that why'd you tell me this? Because I thought you meant that. And they actually get a little frustrated, which is not what you want at a casual gaming event. You want people just having fun and laughing. Now, uh, the other thing I mentioned, uh, the Meeps and Peeps mentions is five minute Marvel has been a hit with casual gamers. I have heard that. that. Haven't tried that game at all, but I have good, heard that. Uh, that's going to fit really good when we get to our next category. Uh, so the five minute Marvel is uh, five minute playing time with a weight of one point eight, but a seven point one rating. Yeah. I've, so people seem to dig that one. There we go. And uh, D brought up Planet, which is yeah. only a one point five weight. How does that go? Is, is that a talkable game once you're familiar with it? I think it is. Um, I think I looked it up and it was only four player and I don't own it yet because you can't find a damn copy of the game anywhere. Uh, Planet, definitely. Uh, it probably begins in our first category, but all I've actually done with Planet is played one demo game at Breakout Con. So to be honest, all my opinions on one incomplete demo game that was staged. So I think <laughs> I really love Planet, but I haven't been able to play it again. I, I'm going to guess, yes, it belongs on this list, but I right. can't prove that. All right. Well, sometimes themed games or licensed games are going to get more people playing at a casual event. Often the trick to get someone to play a game that they normally wouldn't be interested in is to show them a game about their favorite thing. This could be a TV series, a movie, or some trope. Here are some thematic or licensed games that may just be right for your group. Now here's one that again seems to have flown under the radar. Uh, that is Star Trek Five-Year Mission. This is a five-player Star Trek party game. It's a high-player count cooperative dice game that I think is perfect for sci-fi fans or Trekkies that are light, um, light players, casual gamers. Uh, personally, I find this game is a mix of Roll For It and Splendor, if you know what those games are. Because what you're doing is you're rolling dice, and then Yahtzee style you can re-roll, and you're using your dice combo to activate mission cards. When you activate the mission cards, you take them. Some of the mission cards are going to modify your dice going forward. So there's a little bit of engine building there, but it's mostly about trying to clear off mission cards. And the mission cards are all kinds of things going wrong, because so it's cooperative, right? I, I found this one isn't very popular with hardcore gamers because they want this detailed Star Trek game where they're solving missions and fighting Klingons and it's roll some dice and take some cards. But for the Trek game, Trek fans who aren't hardcore gamers, they seem to love this. Like I have seen a group having more fun with this, taking on the whole accents, quoting quotes from the show, everyone playing a different character. Meanwhile, all it is is this rather simple dice game. Yeah, and this one plays seven. Which is some an, an odd max player mm -hmm. count that you really don't see all that often. And and for fans of Star Trek, you can play either crew. You can play the um, Next Generation crew, or you can play the original crew. And it's called Five Mirror Mission because part of the mission is you can mix and match the crew as part of the game. Now, the latest game, in my opinion, of the entire bunch I'm going to recommend tonight, because I was trying to think of a game for role-playing fans, uh, people who are into, like, Lord of the Rings or fantasy or who watch Critical Role but are going to play some board games. Uh, the latest game I could come up with, because uh, most of those dungeon crawl games, like, you don't want to break out a Descent or an Imperial Assault or anything like that. There's just way too many rules, way too complicated. Uh, the game I came up with was Rumble in the Dungeon. Now, this plays six players. Uh, really all you're bringing this out for is the theme because what this is is a quick, silly dungeon crawling game mixed with just a little bit of social deduction. There's 12 characters in the dungeon. There's a treasure chest and either someone gets out with the chest or there's only one character standing. Now the trick is no one knows who's playing which character. So uh, this one's fun and quick. And if you're not a dungeon, if you don't have a dungeon crowd, there's rumble in the house and yep. Cthulhu in the house as well. Yeah. All different themes for the similar game. Yep. Uh, here's another new one. New hotness for me. Uh, that is the 8-bit box. Uh, this includes 
four to six player games. So there's games that can be played with four players, games that can be played with six players, uh, games that can play less. I'm going max player count. So depending on which game you're playing, you might be limited to four players or up to six. Now, this is actually a game toolkit. So it's a bunch of components for recreating classic video games and board game form. Now, the initial box you buy from ELO comes with three games. Uh, and all of them, I think, belong on this list. The first one is Pixoid, which plays four players in this Pac-Man. Uh, then there's Outspeed. This plays six players. And this is one of those combat racing games where you're trying to get to the finish line first and you can shoot each other and play repulsors and drop shields on the map. Uh, the last is Stadium, which plays either four or six players. This is a team-based sports game based on video games like uh, Summer Games from Epix or EPYX. Now, I just broke this one out last week, so you'll hear about this in Tabletop Gaming Weekly, but it went over really well. And I can't wait to get down and uh, give this one a try. Now, my last themed game, though I'm sure there are more out there, is Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. This is a surprisingly good cooperative kids game that I swear is just as good for adults and is perfect for a casual event. Now, this is a retheme of a game we've mentioned multiple times on the show. It is still my strongest kids game recommendation, which is Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. You take Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters and you replace it with the new girls from the new Ghostbuster movie. Now, personally, I prefer the component quality of the original, but if you've got a ghost head in your group, this is going to go over great. Now, I'm personally going to stick with the original. I know we're on a theme topic, and that's why it's in this category, but yeah. uh, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters is the better game. Uh, especially if it references That's the, same the new game. Ghostbusters movie. To be clear, I love the cast. I just hated the script of that movie. <laughs> right. uh, so, so Ghostbusters isn't for Sean. Uh, but so, uh, thematically, <laughs> mechanically, they're yeah. literally the same game. Yeah. So the chat room is saying that Zombie Dice is super light, and that plays two to ninety nine players. Uh, and then that one's all right. That's that's another Yahtzee base. Roll the dice. Try to get get uh, brains or don't get brains. Yeah, get brains and don't get shotguns. It's all right. Uh, dungeon dice as well, which Major Caleb points out, both are great for needing to waste you know five or ten minutes here or there. Uh, and then Jeff uh, mentions a light game with a dungeon theme. He lo he loves is Welcome to the Dungeon, which is a pass or escalate uh, game of chicken sort of. Yeah, that's a push-your-luck dungeon thing where you decide how deep to go, how many cards to flip, and try not to die, and then the next player tries to go deeper than you. It's okay. Uh, again, I'm not a big light game fan, so while I'm answering Emmett's question here, and I think I've got some solid games on this list, a lot of them aren't for me. I found Welcome to the Dungeon way too light, and same thing with Dungeon Dice. Dungeon Dice and, uh, sorry, Zombie Dice and Alien Dice, all those Steve Jackson Dice games I found too light for my taste. One I did like, though, was Dungeon Roll, but it only played plays best with three players but for those dungeon delving dice games i did like that one but again I, i'm yes i can give you some light casual game suggestions but they're not my favorite game so i'm usually looking for something with a bit more meat to it i'm more for the half hour game half hour one hour game than 15 minutes all right well next up definitely not my personal fare but <laughs> social deduction games can be very popular at casual game nights yeah, everyone here probably knows I am not a fan of most social deduction games, but I can't deny their popularity. They need to be on this list for the same reason Pandemic does. I can't remember the last casual game night I was at that I didn't see one or more of the following games being played. They're just that popular. Now, number one is going to be Bang, the dice game. This plays up to eight players. Uh, this could have been in the thematic category. We could have went either way on this one. Uh, one player is playing the sheriff. The rest of the players are either deputies, outlaws, or renegades. Deputies want to protect the sheriff. The outlaws want the sheriff dead. And the renegade just wants to be the last one standing. Now, the trick is the only role people know is who the sheriff is. Now, this was originally a card game that was simplified down and, in my opinion, greatly improved by the dice version. It's less fiddly, it's easier to teach, and it's more accessible to new players than a handful of cards with a bunch of obscure symbols on them. And if you want to bump this into the next, the, the previous category, bang, uh, the dice game, the Walking Dead version is out there. That is there. I have not tried that. I can't speak to it. I assume it's the same game. Now, the most popular game locally for... Uh, social deduction games is by far the resistance. 
Uh, this plays teams of up to 10 players, five per side. Uh, it's a social deduction game where you're sending teams on missions, hoping you don't get sabotaged by the spies, whereas the spies want to make sure they're included on the missions to sabotage them. Uh, this is a modified version of the very popular game Werewolf. Uh, it improves on Werewolf in many ways. Most importantly, it removes the need for a moderator, so all 10 people get to play, and it removes player elimination, so all 10 get people get to play the entire game. Uh, well, you'll never catch me playing Werewolf, you could convince me to play Resistance with the right group. Uh, and just to note that uh, Avalon, uh, the Resistance Avalon, yes. is uh, notably higher rated mm -hmm. than the Resistance. Uh, yeah, and I don't again, recommend. it's a thematic, so if you're looking for a theme that people get into, Arthurian uh, Legends, yep. The Resistance. Yeah, I got to admit, Avalon, I do not recommend. It's just overly complicated compared to The Resistance for teaching really? people. Now, a popular version that's out, though there are... Um, the subject matter can be questionable, depending on the group you're playing with, is Secret Hitler. I didn't want to talk about Secret Hitler here because I've only played one time. What I strongly recommend, though, is if you do dig Secret Hitler, there is a... Harry Potter themed version print and play out there called Secret Voldemort. If you're playing with a casual group or in public, put Secret Hitler away, print and play Secret Voldemort, and then you can have fun trying to figure out who the big villain is. A public service announcement from the tabletop fell <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, up next is Skull. This is a interesting game because it's based on a biker gambling and drinking game. Uh, even sticking to that theme, the playing pieces in Skull are drink coasters, which is what it was originally played with. Uh, this was originally released as Skull and Roses, but you can't find it anymore. Re-released as just Skull. If you can find both, you can combine them and change the six-player game into a 12-player game. Uh, this is a mix of social deduction and push your luck. Uh, it's similar to games like Liar's Dice. So if you played Liar's Dice, you'll probably get this concept pretty quick. Uh, each round, you're going to stack your, your coasters. You have a skull and a bunch of roses, and you're going to put them where you want. Players are going to bid how many coasters they can flip up without revealing a skull. The next player either has to bid more or call them on it. Once they're called on it, they then have to go around going, you flip yours, you flip yours, you flip yours. Oh, there's a skull. I win, I lose. You eventually lose your tiles. Once all your tiles are gone, you're eliminated. Uh, I, I love the fact you can double this to 12 players with two sets, or if you can find Skull and Roses, you can get different looking ones, but there's, it just looks, it's just art. Uh, this is one you could also make yourself, and I'm pretty sure the rules are pretty much free available online. Yeah, I don't have much to say about that one, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's convenient that if two people happen to have it, you can double up and do that yeah. uh, large player count. You could probably do even more, but once you get past 12 players, it's just you someone's going to put a skull on top, right? Like your rounds aren't going to go that well. So that is just like some of the games. There are so many casual games out there uh, just from the chat room, right? They've mentioned almost as many as I have. Uh, here's some stuff I strongly considered having the list and talking about more. And to be honest, there's not really solid reasons why I didn't. It was just which games came to my mind at first. Uh, so I got Gizmos that plays four. Planet, we already talked about, which plays four. A new one I picked up is King of the Dice from Haba. Uh, that's a cool thematic um, fantasy kingdom-based dice game for five players. Uh, the classic Alhambra plays six, though make sure you cover the scoring round rules a couple times and how the walls work because that people do have difficulty with that. Um, there is Bean the Game or Bonanza. Uh, plays up to seven players. We have successfully used that at multiple ca casual gaming events. If I host a gaming event at a pub with drinking, I bring Bonanza. I also always bring the Great Down Moody. Uh, this is an eight-player version of a game. Uh, I think President is a version of it. That's the version I can't say without dinging the bell. A-hole. Uh, is the, the card-based version, but this has cards numbered 1 through 13, and there's 1, 1, 7, 7s, 13, 13s. Try to play all your cards. Uh, there's the classic Carcassonne. Plays five players. If you're into train games, there is an 18xx-inspired train game called Paris Connection. You can play in less than half an hour with six players. Or even at the last event we were at, uh, we were at the Misdirected Mark Party, and there was a group playing The Climbers, which plays five people. Uh, also, uh, the Great Del Moody is also re-implemented by Dilbert Corporate Shuffle. If you want to do something a little more, uh, okay, <laughs> a little more hey, thematic on that thematic. one. Yep, that's an interesting <laughs> one. 
So what I want to know from you people listening at home, we've already had the chat room tell us some of their favorite games. What I miss, I know I miss a lot. I am not a huge casual gamer. I do host events where casual gamers show up, so I do keep a collection of casual games, most of which I just mentioned. I want to know what I've missed. Well, the chat room uh, still at it. Meeps and Peeps has mentioned giant lawn dice and giant dominoes are in the trunk for summer gaming. Giant Jenga, too. There you go. That's some good mass market ones. I don't have any giant games myself. The one I keep seeing on Amazon is like the giant Viking chess set. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, Steve D has mentioned, uh, join us in the chat room, mentioned Werewoods. Werewords is a fun one. I have heard really good things about that. I have not tried it. Um, Sean Gilgore, uh, who's one of the people behind the Queen City Conquest, keeps pushing me to try that game. Maybe I'll get it in this year. Uh, and uh, Nitwit for two to eight Ooh. players. That's a good one. I own that. I didn't even think of that. That is a really unique word game that is actually a Venn diagram game. So you put down a spool of thread with a, a word on it. And then you put, um, oh no, you just put the spools are scoring. I don't know. You put down a spool. But the main thing is you have these loops of thread and you attach um, like uh, bread clips on them where you can write things and you write down a word. And then those loop around spools of thread. And the number of loops around the number on the thread is you have to come with a word that matches all three, the things. So it's the Venn diagram board game. I, I should be able to explain that better. You'd have to see it. It works really well. And it's one of those where everyone looks at it and you're trying to guess words. But if you guess the same word as someone else, neither of you score. So you're trying to find the most ab- abstract, pink, soft, fluffy thing or whatever. Right. Could be the three words that are around it. And another one will be like sharp. Uh, speedy round might be another one and everyone's trying to get it. It's, it's really solid. That's another hidden gem one, actually really well made, really nice components. Uh, solid my, game. One of my thoughts again, it only plays four, but uh, can't stop. I mean, that's, that's what I use yeah. it for on board game arena is, you know, a quick little casual uh, fun play that we can play all the time. I've always got a game of, of can't stop going for that very reason. So, yeah, that's a good one. I, again, I don't own it. Um, there's so many more. Like I, I stayed away from most of the dexterity games. Like, I didn't mention hamster roll for once, but it only plays four. Right? You know, there's just so many honest, great hamster, like, hamster games. roll for me is a little on the thinky side, and you are paying attention to what other people are doing. Yeah, you're not uh, talking. Which which this. takes a bit which takes a bit away from the, the casual nature. To me, a casual game is one that you want to be able to not fully pay attention to what's mm-hmm. happening when it's not your turn, so that you and someone else can just be focusing on talking to each other. And that, yeah. that, to me, that's the, sort of the sign of a really great casual game. I totally agree. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Like I said, like I said right at the top, stop of the top of this, most people who show up to a casual game night are there to hang out and be with people. And games are there. They happen to be part of the night. They'd probably be just as happy sitting somewhere having drinks and chatting as well as playing a game. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. Now, if you do have questions for us, make sure you head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And a big thank you for the activity in the chat. I have not seen so much scroll by in one show before. That is amazing to see. You're making see, our moderator work hard, and it's uh, it's appreciated. It's a good thing. That is a good thing. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. I haven't done this in a long time, but I would love to see some iTunes reviews. iTunes reviews get us up in the Apple rankings and let more people see us. I don't want to talk about Apple every episode, uh, but yeah, if you can give us, sorry, Apple podcast reviews, not Apple iTunes. We would love to see more of those. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email. It recaps all the content we released the week previous. Uh, you got blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, YouTube videos, all of it in one place so you don't miss something we've created. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, for those of you here live, Queen City Conquest is just over a week away. 
Uh, for those of you listening to the podcast version, it starts in two days. Deanna and I are quite hyped. Time is running out to pre-order your badge and sign up for events. For those listening live, you've got a couple of days until July 5th to sign up. For those of you listening, you can still just show up and buy a badge at the door, and there will still be plenty of non-scheduled and open-scheduled events to take part in. Head over to QueenCityQuantQuest.com for more information. Although, did I see correctly that they aren't doing Artemis this year? No, they are not doing Artemis this year. Uh, Greybeard the Grim is not going to be there. He said not enough people showed up, um, and the game does not play well with solos, is the way he worded it. Uh, you definitely need teams of people who are willing to work together, and I guess that was an issue last year. Now, I didn't play last year, so... Well, yeah, I think last year he was sort of trying to man a, a couple of different terminals on his own because he wasn't getting the full squads available, and that was unfortunate. Uh, Jeff is asking, Queen City Conquest. It's a gaming convention in Buffalo, New York. And Jeff, if you would like to go with us, we will drive you there. Uh, we won't be able to help you with the badge or anything like that. But if you want to attend a rather small but awesome gaming convention in Buffalo, it's about three, three and a half hour drive. We will be heading up there Thursday. Now, what did I want to talk about next? Okay. I've got something really cool happening. Oh, that's what I missed. Sorry. If you missed your chance to sign up online to play games with Deanna and I, I don't, I haven't checked to see if our games are full, uh, but we did have a couple scheduled events each. I am running Teo to Walken and Gentis. She's running Terraforming Mars. I think there might've been something else. Don't let that stop you. If you're going to be at Queen City Conquest and you see me or Deanna and you want to play a game together, just come up, tell us we want to play a game together. Um, we both, Got plenty of free time booked into our schedules. Uh, we are there as guests this year, so we're not there as press. So I don't have to work. We're going to game. That's the whole point. So July 27th, that is coming up in what, about three weeks, four weeks time, just about three and a half weeks time. Uh, we got something special coming to Windsor. We have... Ryan Iller coming down from wherever he's from, I'm not actually sure where, to premiere his new board game called Quad Heroes. Uh, he wanted to get his game, have a demo night, have a night to show it off before he did this at Gen Con. So for him, it's kind of a practice. It's a practice to do demo games before he heads off to Gen Con. And we convinced him, or I convinced him, or whatever, we got him to come to Windsor to the CG Realm. So on the 27th, he's going to be here at CG Realm, doing demos of his game Quad Heroes. He's also said he's going to bring some promos, and he's going to give away the demo copies at the end of the night. So that's pretty cool. Now, Quad Heroes looks neat. It is a, he's claiming, he obviously has a video game background, so he's saying that it's a mashup of Super Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, and Zelda. I have no idea. I know it's an adventure game that can be played cooperatively or competitively. It's played on a one-inch grid, and your characters are basically dice, your quads. And the thing is, dice have six sides. Five of the sides of your dice are movement, and one is your special ability. And what you have to do is tumble your die. And what side you turn it to is what action you do. And I got to say, that sounds really cool. That's all I know about the game. Uh, the components look great. It does look like a neat game, but it's a launch party we're going to be having on the 27th at the CG Realm. Anyone who's local is welcome to attend. Now, in addition to that, it's still the regular board game night. So if you just want to come out, play some games, hang out with me, Deanna, and play board games, you can do that too. Uh, but Quad Heroes will be doing demos all night. And uh, just a note, uh, according to Twitter, he's from Ottawa, Ontario. There you go. And you can follow him on Twitter at Wonderment Games. That's at W-O-N-D-E-R-M-E-N-T Games, G-A-M-E-S. Perfect. Yeah, I knew it was somewhere in Canada. I just didn't know exactly where. All right, we've got a new segment here that we're probably going to keep up for the next few months. So you're going to have to listen to us go on about this for three months. But I think it's well worth it because today I took the first steps on the road to Extra Life 2019. Now, 2019 marks our seventh year in a row here in Windsor participating in this fantastic charity gaming event. And we're working really hard to make this the biggest one ever. Now, Extra Life unites thousands of gamers around the world to host fundraising and gaming marathons in support of local Children's Miracle Network hospitals. Yeah, over the last six years, our local community here in Windsor, I'm the one that's been hiding this up, has raised over $21,000 for Extra Life so far. 
Now, while the big 24-hour gaming event isn't scheduled to hit until November 2nd, we're planning a bunch of smaller events leading up to the big day. So, for example, in August, I'm going to be hosting an Extra Life warm-up event at the CG Realm. And at that, we're going to have free open gaming, cheat jars, and probably some other scheduled events. This will be our big fundraising push, trying to get people to join the team and start raising donation money. As this is an official Extra Life event, any hours gained here can count towards participants' 24-hour total on the second. Yeah, that's right. We're all getting older, right? And not all of us can pull off the 24-hour gaming in a row. I try every year and I tap out probably after about 18 hours or so. All we're asking that people do who are raising money, who are officially participating in the marathon, is to get 24 hours of gaming in at some point before the event, end of the event on the 3rd. In September, we'll be hosting a Level Up RPG event in support of Extra Life. I'm sure that's one Jeff will be excited about. Yeah, we want to get some role-playing in. What's going to happen this time compared to our previous Extra Life events is we are going to charge to play the games, but all of that money is going to Extra Life, so it's going to a good cause. And it's going to be up to the individual DMs if they want to allow the cheat jars or any other additional money raising. Now, in October, I'm planning a tournament day. So my goal there is to run a great Canadian board game blitz. It's been about five years since I've run one of these. This is a multi-round board game tournament that has always proved hopeful, fruit popular. I'm also working with Solon to try to get him to do an X-Wing tournament, and I'm going to try to get Steve Joannis to do a Warm Hordes tournament. So we're going to have a big tournament day two weeks before Extra Life. Then the road to Extra Life ends at the actual event. November 2nd. This year we'll be featuring both tabletop gaming at the CG Realm and video gaming at Easy Mode. Yeah, you'll hear about, more about Easy Mode in just a minute. Uh, but what I want is it would be awesome if everyone hearing this right now could come out and game with us. I want to see you people at our events. But I realize that's not for everyone. But you don't have to be local to show your support. You can head over to WindsorExtralife.com. All one word, WindsorExtralife. Dot com and hit the donate button at the top of the page to show your support for what we're doing here. Now, in addition, we are looking for games, games both to feature and play at the event and games to include in our legendary yearly extra life auction. Yeah, our biggest money maker of the year every year is the auction. Uh, it's usually over 100 items. We do a live auction and a silent auction. It's always a big deal, and we are looking for games for that. Now, if you are a game designer or publisher and would like to see your games featured in our, our event, I would love to work with you. Just send me an email at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take this look back, to, uh, take a look at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Uh, so the big thing that happened for me last week was I hosted a game night at a brand new venue. Uh, it's a new place called Easy Mode, which is spelled E-Z-Y, E-Z-Y Mode. Uh, this is an eSports lounge, uh, one that just opened up like in the last month. It's at the site of the old Tecumseh Tavern on Ottawa Street. Now, this place is all about console and PC gaming with a big focus on those tournament style games, right? Your Fortnites, your um, League of Legends, those style of games, whatever people are playing these days. It's not something I keep up with. Um, now, Matt, one of the owners, contacted me expressing an interest in branching out beyond digital gaming and potentially getting some tabletop gamers into their venue. Well, I jumped at that chance. It really is fantastic that Windsor has such a strong, robust gaming scene that it can support so many great events. Yeah, Easy Mode ended up being a fantastic venue for tabletop gaming. Now, I got to admit, it looks great for digital gaming. That's that's not my thing. They had all those fancy chairs that all the Twitch streamers use. I don't know what they call them, but and they had headsets, and they had uh, a mood lighting, and they had lighting effects. I don't know. They look cool. But what I liked is they had plenty of tables and chairs, it was very well lit, and they served food and drink there. Now, I'll admit, for their first event, the food options were a bit limited. We were stuck with hot dogs and snacks. But they are hoping to improve that by having ready-made meals there. So that'll be interesting to see next time. Now, the adult beverage selection was actually significantly better, uh, featuring local Walkerville Brewery beer, as well as cider. And they also had a good variety of cans and hard alcohol. Now, 
Kat mentioned they had a ridiculously good selection of coolers, and as she called them, girly drinks. Not something I pay attention to. Now, for non-alcoholic beverages, they did have juice. Uh, they had free water all night. Uh, they were stopping by the table, topping us up with water all night. Uh, they did have pop, stuff like that. Uh, Deanna did get a coffee. They brewed a pot just for her. Uh, they are a cafe. Like, as far as I could tell, I think they had specialty coffees as well. I will admit we don't do a lot of events with beer, so I was mainly sticking to the water with a pint throughout the night, nice and spaced out, because I was uh, <laughs> we were going to be there for a long time, but I was driving, so I didn't overdo it but I did have a beer when we went there and then three hours in had another and before we left we had one more uh, the cider was the hit of the night Walkerville makes a fantastic not overly sweet cider now one of the best parts though of this was I've run a lot of events in Windsor over the years and most of the time it's me approaching a site asking if we can use their space like we've been at Knights of Columbus we've been upstairs at a pub called the Kildare House we've been at Legions and always they were happy to have us, but kind of like, what are these weirdos doing, right? This was completely different. Like, part of it is they approached me, so obviously they wanted us, but they were very happy to have us there. And it was awesome to be at a venue that not only gives you the space, but is happy to have you use it. Uh, things went so well on Saturday, we're going to make this a recurring event. So now the plan is every third Saturday of every month, we're going to be out at easy mode playing board games. You'll expect to hear more about the venue and the games we play in the coming months. Now, as this is Tabletop Gaming Weekly, you want to know about the games I played. So I'm going to go through those probably pretty quickly, not as much detail as I always would. Um, number one was Gokuku for Haba. I've talked about the game earlier. I've been talking about this game since Origins. This was the first game we broke out. You want to talk about a casual game. It's perfect. This is what we played when people were waiting for people to show up. I am loving this game. Though at this point, I found it ironic that I still hadn't played this game with kids. And it's part of the Haba Yellow line, which is supposed to be their kids game. And I haven't played this kids game with a single kid at the point of time of heading easy mode. Uh, this was more adults who were consuming adult beverages. Uh, Gokuku's great. You know what? Some products just exceed initial market expectations. What more can you say? Now, after this, uh, Deanna and I split up because people started showing up. Uh, she offered to take over hosting duties and play some lighter casual games while I sat down to something more meaty, which was a four-player game of Gentis. Uh, again, I have the Kickstarter Deluxified Edition. It looks amazing. I was teaching brand new players, which was cool. One who I'd never met before, so that's another thing that really stood out for easy mode, is it got new gamers out. And that is awesome. That is what I thrive on. I, I am the local gaming ambassador and getting new people out gaming. It, it makes my day. So I taught a brand new player, Gentis, with two of my older friends, and this new player cleaned our clocks, which, wow, uh, that was kind of cool. That that was like he cleaned our clocks. Uh, I still dig it. Um, I'm getting better at teaching it. Uh, if you're going to be at QCC, I'm going to have it with me. I'll teach you to play. And you can catch some Gentis content on our YouTube channel with an unboxing and more to come. Now, up next was something totally new even for me. Now, Easy Mode obviously is a video game place, right? I talked about the 8-bit box earlier. Well, I thought this was the perfect venue to break open the 8-bit box. Well, not break it open because I already unboxed it, but play it. Um, this was a review copy I received from ELO at Origins. Uh, the box itself, as I mentioned earlier, isn't a game. It's a bunch of tools to play a variety of different games, all trying to capture that feel of classic consoles. Now, you get three cartridges that you can play, and we actually played all three of them. And you'll be able to see this unboxing coming soon on YouTube. Now, first up was the game Outspeed. Uh, this is a racing game. But oddly, it's a social deduction racing game as its main mechanic. You're not actually moving around your track. All you care about is what position you're in, first through eighth. Uh, each round, you're going to flip up a card and choose, do you want to take two of the three routes? So it would be an A, B, and C route. Do you take A? Do you take B? Do you take C? Sometimes they're not down. And where you want to send your racer. Now, each route's going to have a mix of costs and benefits, uh, often based on what routes the other players took. Uh, some routes are limited so that only so many players can go down. So if three players choose to go down this route, no one moves. I thought this was a really interesting way to represent console combat racing. Like I would have never thought social deduction for a racing game. It worked pretty well. And it wasn't the kind of social deduction where you have to lie to your friends all the time. So even I enjoyed it. 
It's certainly a combo you don't think of. Social deduction yeah. and race cars is just not very out of the box, but yeah, they made it work, I guess. So I guess that's what a lot of people say, like NASCAR and racing is all about the mental game and knowing when to make your moves. So I guess it fits. Just It was a unique choice. So we followed that up with Pixoid. Uh, this is four-player Pac-Man. Each turn, one of the players is Pac-Man while the other players play the ghost. Sorry, one player is Pixoid and the other three players are viruses. And you're moving around on a circuit maze. Uh, you're not collecting power pellets with every move. What it is is you're going to score a point for every round you don't get caught. If you get the big power pellets where they are, they're bonus points. Uh, this did a really great job of using the components because it gives you a console-like controller and you put your movement direction in hidden so no one can see it. And then you have a gauge at the top that says zero through nine and you put your range. Uh, this was neat. It was very well done. Uh, it was way lighter than outspeed, but it proved really popular with the people playing. I was really impressed by how well it felt like playing Pac-Man. Well, uh, you can't go wrong with Pac-Man. There's a reason why it is a classic game that pretty much everyone is aware of and knows about. Yeah. Now, the last 8-bit box game is Stadium. This was definitely the heaviest, the most complicated. Uh, this game cartridge is trying to recreate the feel of games like track and field, summer games, winter games. Definitely summer games. Sorry, not winter games. Uh, this is a team-based game. So you have teams of two or three players play in 10 different sporting events which are randomized each game so there were some we didn't try now each individual event uses some different system to resolve uh but the entire thing overall was actually about optimizing your turns and not running out of your team's energy so everyone started with 25 energy and if you ran out you wouldn't be able to participate in events anymore uh we all who played it we played four players found the mix of events really cool and what I dug is this really showed off the various things you can do with the 8-bit box components, right? Like everyone's got the same controller and it's got two dials. Well, different. Like one used both dials. One used another dial. Another one just used um, social deduction or talking. Another game was an auction. Some of the games you were allowed to talk to your opponents and some you couldn't. It was really neat. Overall, I got to say the 8-bit box is quite fun. Uh, none of the games are overly engaging. None of them are going to leave a huge lasting impression. But they're a good mix of quick, fun games that do a really good job of recreating that video game feel. It's honestly, the, the last one is actually the one that interests me the most. I, I, maybe it's because I really love the epic summer games mm -hmm. and winter games and uh, world game series. But uh, that's the one that just sounds most interesting to me. No, you, I think you'll enjoy all of them. It, it, it's neat. Now, they are light. Like, these are all casual games. They fit in great with this episode. That wasn't done on purpose. Uh, these are not heavy games. None of them took very long. 15 minutes, half an hour each. Uh, of all of them, the sports one, Stadium, definitely took the longest having to do 10 different events. Now, after putting the 8-book box away, uh, the group I was playing with knows most of the other people were already tied up in other games. Uh, just to give you an idea of what was going on at the event I wasn't playing, there was a game of Terraforming Mars, uh, Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu was going down, there was a large group playing Resistance, uh, they were playing the Avalon version. Uh, so what we did is we were just trying to kill time while other people finished stuff up, and I broke out Blockus. Now, I was shocked by how good block is, is like this is a mass market game you can get at walmart target pretty much everywhere uh that is really good uh it's an abstract strategy game that the entire family enjoys and way it went over way better than i thought at the event now maybe that's because it was getting later into the night and more beverages were being drank but like we played a total of three games of block in a row uh, a couple with three players and one with four players and at the end of the night i'm just like man i gotta bring block out more often it is a way better game than I like i knew it was good i always enjoyed block but i'm like no it's good good right uh, it does help to have all the pieces, though, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it does. We did have uh, the same person won all three games, and then when I got home, I found a green cross piece sitting here on my desk. So, yes, uh, Justin had a bit of an advantage during all those games. But even that, it was still fun. Now, after finishing up our third game of Blockus, uh, the official event was over. So I booked the event from 5 till 10, but Easy Mode's actually open till 2. My booking it from 5 till 10 means I'm going to play host till 10, and I'm going to teach games. But after that, everyone's kind of on their own. They're welcome to leave or stay around. Most people did leave at this point, but there was a small group of us that did stay for one more round of drinks and play one more game. 
Now, that game was Sink Terror from Rio Grande Games, which I mentioned in the main topic. Uh, again, this is a hidden gem gateway game that I personally think is a perfect next step game from Ticket to Ride. It's all about collecting cards, trading those cards for fruits, and then delivering them to the villages to fulfill objectives. Uh, it has a lot of similar elements to Ticket to Ride, and it's just as easy to teach while having some much more deep or solid decision points during the game. I'm a big fan of this game, and it was really cool to share this with the people who had not played it before. Now, I know one couple who were trying to pick up a copy, but at the time of that event, we didn't realize how out of print this game is. So I highly doubt Tori and Kat managed to find a copy before this weekend. Well, you know, it's a good sign for an event if people are adding games to their wish list. And this should be a reminder to all those FLGS owners out there why it's important to run game nights. Yes. <laughs> So those are all the games I played at Easy Mode. Now, besides the ones I already mentioned, I also saw people playing Azul. Uh, Splendor got played. Gizmos was played. There was a, a large table playing Gloom. Uh, that same group then played You've Got Crabs. Bang the Dice game was out. Uh, those are the ones I noticed, and I probably missed some. I got to say it was awesome to see so many different tables of gamers all playing together and playing a variety of games. And I'm really looking forward to getting back to Easy Mode next month. All right, maybe some of you guys will be there. Listeners will be there, too. Yeah, what's nice about two is you're not at a game store. I realize not everyone likes gaming at game stores due to either loyalty issues or just feeling the pressure that you should buy something when you're there. You go to easy mode, you can have a drink, you can uh, grab a hot dog, or hopefully they'll have more food next time, and just focus on the gaming. Now, last week on the podcast, we had our first ever Ask Us Anything or Ask Me Anything, AMA, whatever you want to call it. Uh, one of the questions we were asked in the middle of the show was, what are our favorite childhood games? And during that segment, I talked a lot about Cats from Chieftain Games. Now, after the show, I actually pulled out my old copy of Cats and shared a few features on social media. Now, Cat saw this and was like, oh, we have to play. We have to play. Oh, my God. So I'm like, all right, if we finish Gloomhaven early enough, we'll play. And we did have enough time, so we did. Now, not only did we play, I fear we had the stream set up for Gloomhaven, so we actually live streamed Cats. Now, this is probably the first and only live stream of Cats you will ever see. For those of you who missed it, don't worry, we'll be putting up a slightly edited version on YouTube sometime soon. Now, Cats, or Cats Mansion as it's also known, is a social deduction game where you have a clue-like board with a bunch of rooms separated by halls on a one-inch grid. In the middle of each side of the board, you'll find an object that Cats desire. And in the middle are five cushions with five different cats on them. At the start of the game, each player is secretly assigned one cat and the object that that cat desires. Each turn, players take exactly four moves. They can either move cats or objects or both, but only two of each type maximum. The goal is to get your cat to their preferred object. Now, after cats move each turn, players can play meow cards with the names of various rooms around the board on them. This causes the cat to rush to that room to see what's going on, unless someone plays a purr card, which cancels out one of these moves. That's right, so a purr cancels a meow. Yep. Now, the only other rule is that when a cat passes another cat, they can hiss at that cat, moving it back one space. That's it. That's pretty much it. Though, so always remember, you can't hiss a cat through a wall. But you can punch an orc through a window. Now, I'm pleased to say both Kat and Tori were rather enamored with Cats. I think we played four times in a row. Uh, we did play Extreme, of course, because, you know, that happens. Even though I've owned the game since the 80s, I did forget a few of the little rules. But we house-ruled that game so much over the years that it's hard to remember what the actual rules are. Uh, this is still one of the best games from my childhood. Like, even now, there, there is way more game here than you would expect, and way more game than you found for most games from the 80s. Like, actual tactics are required, and you can, like, not master it, but you can learn to play well in Cats. It's not just random. I, I dig this game. I always have. I think I always will. Yeah, no, I've got some very fond memories of this. Uh, whether or not I remember the actual real game or just the house rules we played, <laughs> yeah. it's still a great time playing it. 
Yeah, Deanna saying in the chat, I have no excuse for not knowing the rules. It's only one page and I played for 30 years. But how many times <laughs> I play with the actual rules the over problem. those 30 years? That's the problem is re- trying to remember what the real rules were and what were the rules we just made up. It's kind of like the Monopoly thing, right? The the money on no parking. Like our, our biggest house rule is like in the rules, if you purr, your cat can't move anymore. And I know we used to purr, meow, purr, meow, purr, meow, and play your entire hand of cards. I know that one was wrong. We used to move more than two objects of each type. I know that was something else we played wrong. We totally screwed up the acquisition or uh, accusation rules when we were playing. But yeah, I, Cats is good. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to see if we get any feedback on the YouTube video when that one goes live, just because it's such a classic game that most people probably haven't even heard of. So, All right, the last game of the week for me is Go Cuckoo again. I've been talking about this game a lot. It's my new Azul, I guess, because that was a game we talked about for months. This seems to be it. But what I finally did now is played with kids, my kids. And, man, yeah, they loved it. Um, I figured that was going to happen. Both my kids take music lessons here in Windsor, and their music teacher has a party at the end of the year for all their students, which is pretty cool. Um, There's food and drinks and stuff and lots of music. But we got there pretty early, and we were kind of killing some time, and I happened to bring the games with me just in case there was some time for it. And while people were still showing up, music hadn't started, I went and grabbed Go Cuckoo, and we played it on the back porch on the patio. Um... It was good. We played four players, the kids, Deanna and I. Uh, kids seem to enjoy it as much as every adult that's played it. Uh, this is now my 11th time playing this game. Uh, first time actually playing with kids, though. So I got to say, a, a bit of me was worried that the kids wouldn't like it, but that was quickly proven unfounded. Uh, both girls took the game right away. Big G managed to win our game. Um, and since then, the kids have asked me multiple times to play again. Uh, seems to be always when it's completely inappropriate, like, hey, we're going out to dinner. I'm like, no, no, you can't bring Go Cuckoo into the Beacon Ale House. We'll, we'll save it from when we're at home. I don't know. It seems like a perfectly reasonable uh, request to me. <laughs> I don't know. This is like pickup sticks and stuff. All that. I don't know. I played it at restaurants at Origin, so maybe it's not that bad. Uh, at this point, I'm starting to think Go Cuckoo is going to be my like 2019 game of the year, which is kind of shocking seeing that it's a game most definitely added I aimed at kids. This is this is a kids game I'm having fun with, right? This is an animal upon animal. It's one of those rare kids games that is literally just as fun for adults. Um, this is proving to have near universal appeal. Kids, parents, gamers, nine pit gamers, everyone digs this game. So yeah, I was I was confused when I when I saw the purchase uh, come through on your on your media, media mm. feed at Origins. But uh, the hype surrounding it seems to be borne out by the sheer volume of plays that it's had <laughs> yes. since you purchased it. And just in full disclosure, this was not a purchase. I was I was provided uh, a review copy by oh, Haba, sorry. but I did ask for it. I did specifically request, based on Wayne Humfleet, the Star Wars guy, told me I had to check out this game. So when I met with T from uh, Haba, I asked them if I could specifically try this game, and that was the game that they handed me to bring home. So that, that is a review copy. And I got to say, I hope I'm selling it well enough for you, Haba. Cause, and trust me, that's not why I'm digging this game that much. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have a conversation here about our pile of shame. Cause I'm not sure what we should do about this. Right. Uh, speaking of that review copy and many more. So the entire point of the less shame, more game challenge that I signed up to do uh, on our New Year's party was playing my pile of shame is to get those unplayed games I own played. Uh, A noble cause, obviously. The thing is, when I decided to take part in this challenge, I had no idea just how generous companies would be with review copies at Origins. I was not expecting to bring home nearly as much as I did uh, from that convention. Now, the thing with the review copies is that I have to do the work, right? Like, I don't just get to take those home and play them. Unlike the games in my current pile of shame, I have a literal obligation to play these games and let you guys know what I think, guys and girls. You folk know what I think. What this means is I need to focus on those games. I need to focus on these new games over the games I owned before. So... I'm not sure how we want to track that on the show, and I'm open to ideas. Well, we, we have two options here, really. Um, basically, we can keep that nasty number up on the top of the screen <laughs> up there, and uh, you know it's not going to go down. Um, and it could either go up 
or stay where it is. Um, yeah. And then the other option is that we we discreetly remove that that yeah. uh, that number off there, and we we stop discussing that, and we talk about you know games from the pile of shame, but uh, we take off the number because we really don't have any way to accurately represent it anymore. Yeah, it, it goes. Yeah, like the way I saw it is two options, right? Drop it, drop the count at the top of the screen. Stop talking about it. Um, or the other option, like you're saying, leave it. The other thing is we could just add in all the games we got at Origins, and which will count, because I do. They're all shame games. They're all games that have to be played, so I have my work games and my non-work games all in the same pile. Uh, if we do that, though, the count is going to be up to 95 games, and then we get to knock it down to 92 because I played those three 8-bit box games. So that's a ridiculous number. I don't know. I also thought of like putting a slash, right? Like here's my personal pile of shame and my pile of obligation. But the thing is my personal pile of shame shouldn't go down unless the other one's going down, right? Like I am literally obligated to play these games, right? It's work. Um, I'd be interested to know what the chat room thinks. I'm, I don't know. I see Steve D is saying change it to a personal pile. But I yeah, and, personal and pile Jeff, is, Jeff is saying separate piles as well. I think we. I think the, the majority is, is at the very least uh, keeping review copies separate. Um, but, now but is it even keep... even we, we're tracking on the show, right? Do uh, do yeah. we keep the sixty six slash? I don't know. I'd have to open it up the the math difference there <laughs> slash thirty five or whatever it is. I, I at this point, I mean, we haven't been active with it uh, at this point. I think at this point they should be kept separate, uh, and we should talk about games that are played, uh, review games as review games because we have to. Oh well, yeah, we obviously have to uh, indicate that they are review games yep. uh, and then we can talk about playing games off the pile of shame. But I, I don't think account at this point is really adding anything to the program. All right. The, the chat room, our fans seem to be thinking two separate piles. So do we have two counts? I don't know which corner it's in two counts up in the corner and we leave the two counts up in the corner with a, a slash or do we. Yeah, I'm thinking ditch, ditch the count. The like count, we're, yeah. we're still going to talk about it, right? Yeah, like, yeah we're still going to talk about a lot of shames. But all it's right. just an actual number up there makes uh, very little. Can you actually play all the? No, there's no way. I no, don't. It will think. never Jeff, be. Jeff is saying I don't think I am going to get through my 66 games that <laughs> I owned that New Year's last year. Um, yeah, and, and and Danielle is correctly pointing out that it does tend to go down and then back up. Yeah. It just, I wasn't expecting it to jump by over 20, right? That really was was a huge jump. Yeah, because I think we started at 69. No, it was 85. Was it 85? Was, 85. No, was it that high? Okay. Yeah, 85 at the start of the year. Well, so it did actually drop a good bit. Yeah, I got, I got through over 20. Well, the thing is, too, is I bought a lot of games. Everything I had bought in 2019 got played, except for sure. like this new stuff. Everything I personally had bought in 2019 has already been played. Everything that was in the pile of shame is stuff I've owned for too long, which is why it was the pile of shame. This isn't a pile of shame. This is a pile of obligation. This is a pile of games I'm excited to play because I personally picked these games. It's not like companies went, here, review this. No, I went, hey, can I try that? Can I try that? Can I try that? Um, so this is a vetted list of games that I am excited to play. All right. Well, I think for now at least, wink, wink. Gone. <laughs> All right. I and can't we'll, see. Uh, what we'll see what happens. Yeah. If I keep getting review copies, we'll never hit zero, which means I'm doing a good job, right? That's I'm doing what I should be doing. And now one thing I'd be willing to do is we keep it in the after show, right? I've taken it off the main show. It doesn't, it doesn't oh, yeah, sit on the live. The after show can still have a number there. And yeah. at that point, I think you may as well set it to 92. Okay. Right. Count yeah, every game I've got here. That's unplayed. Sure. <laughs> sorry, just sorry. Our chat room is having a moment of silence for the fallen pile of shame count. <laughs> I'm, I'm amused. All right, so now we kind of know what we're doing with the pile of shame count. Oh, if you're listening at home, right? Like we're just asking the chat room. If you're listening at home and you have strong opinions on the pile of shame, let me know. We we can bring it back. I'm I'm not totally sold on what we're doing here. I I. I just know that there's no way those 66 games are going to get played with everything that's behind me, right? Well, it's not behind me anymore. Sorry, we have a new backdrop. We did swap it out this week. But uh, before those other games get played. All right. 
so now that we got that figured out, let's look to the future. Is there anything you're gaming related you're looking forward to this time, Sean? Oh, sadly, I think even less chance than usual. Uh, even with the kids home from school, work right now is just pinning me down. And again, this week with the holiday, uh, you know, cramming everything into two days, it's uh, it's just been tough. We gotta we gotta get some maybe some online terraforming Mars in or something mm-hmm. later at night when you're not as tied up. Yep. Uh, personally, what we just talked about, I'm all about those review copies now, right? Um, I want to get it in some more plays of the 8-bit box. I'm going to write up a full review. Uh, the next one I'm really excited about is King of the Dice. I really want to get that out with my girls now that they're home from school. Uh, we spent the beginning of this week working. Both Deanna and I have been working rather hard. Uh, we need to spend some time with the girls, and I'm hoping to get them to try King of the Dice. I think they're going to dig it. Um, and I'm working with CG Realm to do a demo night of Sorcerer. So not only do I, I have to unbox Sorcerer still, but that's a hot one from um, White Wizard Games that I'm really looking forward to playing. I was just talking to the owner of CG Realm tonight. I had a meeting with him. We're going to try to throw together a demo night at the store to get that one played. Now, we're pretty much at the end of the show at this point. we got a couple more things to do. Anything else going on in the chat room before we say goodnight? Oh, wow. We've had so much chat going on. There was a whole lot of discussion about that pile of shame. And you know what, guys? I really want to say thank you. It has been fantastic seeing uh, new names in the chat list and uh, people, you know, busy and chatting. Uh, It's great that uh, Steve was able to make it in tonight. Jeff had some time off and was able to join us. Uh, we've had some great action from Meeps and Peeps talking in there. Always fantastic to have uh, Major Kayla, Danielle in the chat room. Uh, and it's just been a uh, wonderful one for tonight. Nice. I know as Jeff's talking about his goals to play RPGs, uh, he's excited for Blood on the Clock Tower. I know I am not doing a pile of shame for my unplayed RPGs. Uh, that <laughs> number would need two more digits on yeah, it. Yeah. Literally. We, we like, only have so much joking. space on the screen. There's yeah, no. Like, like, I'm not joking. It would, uh, even if I count physical books, the number would be huge. If I add um, PDFs, my God, like, no. I'm, I'm, I I have a pile of shame for yes. RPGs. Like, yeah. no. <laughs> I will admit there is going to be at least one RPG, at least read, because I got to do a review of uh, Runaway Hirelings has to get. I'll do at least a read, read review of that. And I will be doing a read review of the Shadowrun Beginner Box. Um, possibly I'll try to get those to the table as well. I did say hirelings. I think did, I said did we hirelings. Get, was there a, was there a June RPG of the month? What was that? I, did no, I, I, I stink. Oh, you were so there, good. You, the, the, you've been doing so well. I'll put it this way. There wasn't a May. There was a May I read. I just never wrote up about it. Oh, because I knew you did one in May. I just I yeah, didn't I never you wrote write up. It up. I, I read Dungeon Crawl Classics in May, but I right. never even did a write up on it. And then I didn't do anything last month. I know I was doing good, but like, origins and moving my dad and everything and not getting people over on monday nights yeah i'm falling behind i was doing good on that challenge every year i fall apart i fell apart later this year anyway so thank you all for the chat room everything sean said applies to me as well it's awesome to see you guys chatting i love it it makes it uh makes me glad to be here on twitch because sean and i could easily just record this on skype it's it's awesome to see you guys interacting with us. That's part of why we do this, is we want to be here for you. And now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Mr. Acton Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Roger Malosh, thank you. Roger Linscott Jr., thank you. That sounds like a double bell to me. Uh, It's been a good shift, but I'm going to have to lock the front doors. It's time to go home. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Stay your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. We mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, now that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. 
For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the Penthouse Suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. <laughs>